Good morning. Uh, I'm Spencer Overton. I'm a professor of law here at George Washington University. I'm also the director of the GW Political Law Studies Initiative. Uh, and so welcome to GW. And we founded the GW Political Law Studies Initiative to provide a neutral venue for, for scholars, government officials, practitioners, policy advocates to come together, discuss ideas, develop the political law field, and create bipartisan professional networks. And so when Sheila Krumholtz approached me about GW hosting the Center for Responsive Politics for this event, it made perfect sense. Uh, I am proud to be a former board member of the, Citizen for, uh, the Center for Responsive Politics. And, and I'm glad to welcome the Center to GW uh, to discuss the growing role of politically active nonprofits in our electoral system. Uh, many of these entities do not have to disclose their donors to the public, and in that way they are unlike just about all other groups that try to influence people on how to uh, how people vote in elections. Uh, skeptics of disclosure assert that disclosure chills speech. The IRS, after being silent about the many questions being raised about these groups, uh, has just come up with some proposed regulations that are drawing all kinds of reactions, and we'll hear about those today, too. And so thank you all for coming, and I assure you that uh, this panel is going to be much more engaging and resilient than that sign. <laughs> <laughs> So let me turn it over to Sheila. Sheila, welcome. Come on up uh, and, and get, us, get us going. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thanks, Spencer. Uh -huh. Well, it's great to be here at GW. Thank you all for joining us. Yes. Uh, I'll just remedy that. Anyway, let me introduce our today's speakers. Uh, Jan Barron has been named a top campaigns and elections lawyer by Washingtonian Magazine, the dean of campaign finance, and one of the top 50 lawyers in Washington, D.C advising clients on all aspects of political law, including federal, state, and local campaign finance laws, government ethics requirements, and lobbying laws. He has argued cases before the Supreme Court of the United States, and it often provides legal commentary to the media. I know we were on Day and Ream together. That was fun. And Mr. Barron served as a legal analyst for ABC News during the 2000 Florida recount. He is the author of the book, The Election Law Primer for Corporations. Provided, uh, sorry, published by the American Bar Association, and he co-chairs the Practicing Law Institute's annual Corporate Political Activities Conference. Peter Overby is NPR's Power, Money, and Influence correspondent, covering campaign finance and lobbying, said to be the best title in Washington. Uh, Overby was awarded an Alfred I. DuPont Columbia Silver Baton for his coverage of the 2000 campaign and the 2001 Senate vote to tighten the rules on campaign finance. The citation said his reporting set the bar for the beat. In 2008, he teamed up with uh, Center for Investigative Reporting on the Secret Money Project, an extended multimedia investigation of outside money groups in federal elections. Uh, he also produces or produced Dollar Politics, a multimedia examination of the ties between lawmakers and lobbyists as Congress considered the health care overhaul bill. Before coming to NPR in 1994, Peter was a senior editor at Common Cause Magazine and he shared a 1992 investigative reporter and editor's award for magazine writing. Donald Tobin uh, has traveled the farthest to be with us today, for which we're grateful. Uh, he is the Frankie and Virginia H. Basler designated professor in business law uh, at uh, Moritz College of Law at the uh, Ohio State University. He's quickly become one of the nation's leading experts on the intersection of tax and campaign finance laws. Professor Tobin developed his interest in tax, economics, and election law while serving on Capitol Hill and in the U.S. Department of Justice. He arrived at Ohio State University Moritz College of Law in 2001 and has since served as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Associate Dean for Faculty, the Frankie and Virginia H. Basler designated professor in business law, co-director of the program on law and leadership, and senior fellow of law at Moritz Election Law at Moritz Program. Prior to his service with uh, Excuse me, I'll uh, go on. Vivica, edit, our Editorial and Communications Director at the Center for Responsive Politics, Vivica Novak, is a Washington reporter that joined the center in December 2011 as Editorial and Communications Director. Her 
duties include running the Open Secrets blog, fielding press inquiries, and developing media partnerships. She has been deputy director of factcheck.org and is Washington correspondent for Time Magazine uh, and the Wall Street Journal. She has won a number of journalism awards, including Harvard's Goldsmith Prize for Investigative Reporting, and co-authored a book, Inside the Wire, about the U.S. Detention Center at Guantanamo. Vivica received a degree in foreign affairs from the University of, of Virginia, and an MS in journalism from Columbia University. In addition, she completed a fellowship in law for journalists at Yale Law School. And last but certainly not least, Robert McGuire, CRP's political nonprofits investigator, joined the Center for Responsive Politics in August 11, in 2011. He's responsible for researching and monitoring data on PACs, super PACs, uh, and 527s, and uh, most especially has uh, carved a new path on research on uh, political nonprofits, uh, often referred to as dark money. Robert. Robert has a master's in U.S. foreign policy from American University. And before coming to Washington, D.C., Robert lived, studied, and worked for several years in France and Taiwan, traveling extensively in both Europe and Asia. He's a Renaissance man. And we're all uh, so grateful to have you with us. <laughs> and I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Robert. All right. Let's see. Uh, I've made my first Prezi. Let's see if it actually works. Uh, so it is not quite fit on the screen, but that should be okay. Well, I'm Robert McGuire. I am the political nonprofit investigator. I'm going to talk briefly about some trends and some discoveries we've made uh, since we started this project about a year and a half ago. Um, but the first point I'd like to make is the data that I'll be citing here is from the IRS and the FEC, but it is not actually from the IRS and the FEC. That's because uh, we have been manually inputting records for the better part of the last year, um, actually more than a year. We've got about 16,000 records because the IRS does not create machine-readable data. So we take, we've taken more than 1,000 990s. We've taken all the grants from them. We've taken multiple years of uh, all politically active nonprofits IRS data and then we match it up with the FEC. The FEC has no IRS data, so we have gone in and found all the groups that have filed with the FEC, put in identifying information, and then we've matched all of the data up for five years um, with, uh, by start date and end date. So it's the only data set that perfectly matches IRS and FEC data. Um, so this is sort of the big picture of what we're seeing. Um, the red line is 501c5 unions. Uh, blue line is 501c4s. 501c6s are in orange. 501c6s being trade associations. And you can see there was uh, unions by far spent more than c4s and c6s until 2008, which uh, was right after the Wisconsin Right to Life decision. Uh, and then in 2010, it just sort of explodes. So the trend is up, but the types of groups that are spending are somewhat different. You can see that unions are actually going down. Um, now this is slightly different. This is non-disclosing groups. Uh, non-disclosing, we consider, for example, unions to be disclosing groups. Uh, but a super PAC, for example, that receives all its money from a 501c4 or 501c6 would also be a non-disclosing group because it's disclosing donors that don't disclose their donors. Um, you can see there actually is spending here, but it's so small that you can't actually see it. Uh, this is the problem with making any graph uh, for outside spending because the numbers on this side are so big that all of the other numbers disappear. Um, but you can see up until now, it's been overwhelmingly conservative, and we'll see at the end that this is changing, uh, or it might be this cycle. Um, and in the last cycle, we, we got up to about $310 million in non-disclosed spending, um, far more than we've ever had uh, in the federal elections. And that's just what's reported. Um, so those are the, that's sort of the trend that's just happening. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've found in terms of 
what groups are doing to get around the limits of uh, non-disclosing groups, or, or, or the limit, the political limits for spending. Um, we can talk about pass-throughs, disregarded entities, churns, and ebb and flow. Uh, Vivica and probably Peter are going to talk a little more about some of these in detail. I'm just going to run through them. Um, so this is uh, the pass-through. You see these three groups here. Uh, these three groups received about $301 million total. Uh, that's not double counting the money that went to these two groups and then went to this one. 90% um, of their money went right back out in grants to other organizations below here. So they didn't do anything. Uh, they, they simply just took the money and passed it through to other organizations. The, we, we can only really speculate why they're doing it, um, because they're not very fond of talking to us. Um, but there's several ways. For example, the reason that they pass through so many times is because each time you pass money through, you, it multiplies the social welfare value of the money. Uh, one group takes in a million, gives it to another group, and then that group gives it to another group. That's about $3 million in social welfare spending, because each group gets to, to count the million dollars that's going through. Um, it also makes it much harder to track. If the IRS is going to to jump into this and try and sort this out, and they're looking for you know the, the original donor of 60 plus associations money, they're going to have to go back through this web of groups. And it's not clear what data they have available internally to even be able to do that. Um, so that's a big question. Uh, disregarded entities. Um, we originally found this with TC4 Trust, and. Uh, Vivica is going to talk about this more, but essentially what it is is we're starting to find that groups aren't actually giving to, when TC4 Trust gives to the Center to Protect Patients' Rights, it's not actually listing a grant to the, citizen, uh, the Center to Protect Patients' Rights. It's listing a grant to, well, one was illegible, but then something called American Commitment LLC, 11th Edition LLC, and Corner Table LLC, all of which have different employee identification numbers, which we just happened to find out were wholly owned subsidiaries of the Center to Protect Patients' Rights. All of that money, in effect, was going to CPPR, but it was the grants were being shown to go to uh, the, the disregarded entities. And this is the, the churn. Um, you can't see that because it's kind of, I don't know why it's up there. Anyway, um, the other thing we're finding, not just the pass-throughs, but just these circles of money. One group gives to another group and this is actually something we did with NPR for Wellspring. Um, the, for example, here, Wellspring will give to the annual fund, and Wellspring will also give to these three groups, which the annual fund will also give to. Um, this, again, it's the same sort of idea of multiplying social welfare value of the money. Um, because Wellspring gets, to, Wellspring gets to count the social welfare value of the grant to the annual fund, and then also the grants to the, the groups below. And this is what I call the ebb and flow. Uh, and essentially, this, these are the overall IRS reported spending by these groups uh, in on years or election years and off years. Um, and the reason I find this interesting is that a group that is not supposed to be a political group, uh, you would expect them to have maybe slightly higher spending in an election year, but many of these groups have almost the entirety of their total IRS reported spending in election years. And actually, we have 2012 data, but again, I didn't put it in because these off-year spending totals would have disappeared. Uh, for example, the tallest bar here, Crossroads GPS total spending in 2010 uh, was between 40 and 45 million. This year they reported, I believe it was $179 million. Um, American Future Fund, is it 20 million here? Uh, they, they received from the, the Coke Network before alone $63 million. So their reported spending is probably going to be much higher than that. And finally, 2014. Um, <coughs> 
this, this measures from December 5th and every off year, the spending by non-disclosing groups. So as you can see, we're already well above even the record setting year of 2012 at this point. Um, and it's overwhelmingly liberal. Um, it's, this is sort of uh, interesting to see if maybe the ideological split on use, the use of dark money is changing. Uh, maybe liberals have decided that uh, you know, you've got to use whatever weapons you can to win because at the end of the day, that's what they want to do. Um, but I don't know, it's very early in the cycle, so we'll have to see, but this is something that we'll be looking out for. So um, my work has centered for the last probably 13 years on tax-exempt groups and their involvement in politics. And so um, I'm going to talk briefly today about these new proposed regs that the, the IRS has uh, put out and my, my view, but also how, how big a deal I think it is. But to do that, I need us to, to step back and remember where we were. Because one of the things we hear when we hear this excitement about the sky is falling with what IRS action is, um, that we've, we've gone so far from where our default was, from where, from where the rules were. The rules have been abused so much and pushed so far that when we move back even just a little bit, it seems like people are, are it's to their advantage to claim the sky is falling, but it, it, it's clearly not. So let me just very briefly remind everybody where we were, right? So, so Prior to 2000, the statutory structure was that 501c3 organizations were our charities. They were prohibited from intervening in a political campaign completely. What was intervention is, is a debate, but, but in general, they weren't supposed to engage in politics. Section 527 organizations were started, and the reason for their existence was to engage in politics. So 527 political organizations where we expected groups to engage in candidate advocacy. And then we had C4s, C5s, and C6s. C4s were social welfare organizations, C5 labor, C6 is business leaders. And that's what they were intended to be. They were intended to be social welfare organizations, labor unions, and business leaders. They were not intended to be political advocacy organizations. And that was our statutory structure. And then in the elections before 2000, we saw a lot of abuse by 527 groups in avoiding disclosure. We just keep coming back to people trying to avoid disclosure. And so Congress added disclosure provisions um, into 527. And I, I see Professor Hill here. She was one of the first people, I think, to write about the fact that all this was going to do was cause groups to be uh, to move to C4s. And I think I remember reading that when I was writing a brief on defending 527 back in, in 2001. So a lot of professors were talking about, well, if you put disclosure here and you don't expand it, you're going to have exactly the problem that we have today. And that's what happened. Groups moved from 527 to C4. But in order to do that, they either had to lie, misreport, or exaggerate. Because C4s were, were supposed to primarily engage in social welfare, they were not supposed to engage in politics. And so what we've seen since 2000 is a very, very aggressive move by social welfare organizations claiming they're not involved in politics or claiming that they're doing issue advocacy. They are claiming that they're doing lobbying to avoid these restrictions. So really, what the IRS is coming forward with is a plan to stop abuse, not a plan to further restrict activity. It, it, from a tax perspective, which is my, my main home, uh, I, I always say this is like tax shelter. 
<coughs> the IRS is very used to dealing with that, right? Where, where taxpayers want to push as far as they can to, to keep, depending on your politics, to keep more of your money. Um, and, and the IRS has to come in and say, well, wait a minute, that's, that's not appropriate. And, and now we're starting to see that in the election context. Um, and and the, the problem for the IRS, as everybody now knows so clear, uh, dipping your toe into political waters is, is very dangerous. So the statutory structure had five major things that I think caused a lot of this to happen. One, as I've mentioned, is this idea of um, <coughs> how far people were willing to push the envelope regarding the, the definition of political intervention and what their activity was. Um, the second is the uh, C4 rules talk about that you have to be exclusively engaged in social welfare, but the regulations allow for primarily. And so we have a lot of gains regarding what is primarily. Uh, social welfare groups are not even required to apply for C4 staff. So one of the things that's so interesting about this alleged, alleged scandal, crisis, whatever you want to call what's happening with the IRS, is most of these groups didn't even have to apply for C4 status. They could have just been what's called self-declaring organizations. Um, if you're a self-declaring organization, you don't have to file with the IRS about your existence. And so it can be up to 22 and a half months before you actually file anything with the IRS. So these groups are, are not only out, able to operate in secret because of disclosure, but they're actually able to operate in secret about their existence. And then we've had, you know, we've had almost no enforcement by the IRS, and, and I, I would come pretty close to saying no enforcement from the IRS. As a person who looks and reads in this area, there are very, very, very few cases uh, talking about this. And so it's very hard, even as a lawyer, to understand exactly where the lines are because there's not a lot of guidance. And then we have uh, what I think everybody is aware of as the Federal Election Commission, which makes it very difficult to have any enforcement. So that's the situation we found ourselves in before the proposed regs. And there's been a lot of us who have been shouting for the IRS to provide more guidance and do more things. Um, and so that's the drop by backdrop for discussing these regs. And what's important to understand that, because these groups that are coming out and saying, oh, this is the end of free speech as we know it, or you know, we have this right to First Amendment, <laughs> They're completely wrong. I mean, it's very rare as a law professor that I'm willing to really say somebody is completely wrong. But they're completely wrong. And they're completely wrong because nothing in these regulations, nothing in the regulations of C4 prohibit groups from engaging in speech. They have lots of outlets they can do it. Nothing here tells them they can't speak. Nothing here says they can't be involved in politics. All it says is if you're involved in politics, and that's your primary purpose, you're going to have to be a 527, and you're going to have to and the Supreme Court has upheld disclosure provisions. So there's nothing here that prohibits a group from acting. And I think one of the things that we do have to have some sympathy for is we want small groups to be able to engage in political advocacy without too much regulation. And we're not overly worried about groups that are spending $25,000. And we're not overly worried about somebody who wants to run a campaign for school board. Um, and we should have some sympathy that they don't need to hire um, big time lawyers. Oh, they do. <laughs> um, and, so, um, and so we want to put ourselves in that situation, but the idea that this somehow restricts speech uh, is ridiculous. So what do, we, what do we have going on in the regulations, and what do I think about them? So, so my view is that I really applaud the IRS for what they did. I think structurally they, they did a nice job. This is the start of a dialogue and that, that needs to be had. Um, and I think for a start of a dialogue, they did, they did a really thoughtful job. Um, and they make some nice moves that, that I think at least are, are, are going to be helpful. Uh, in the end, I have to say I'm not sure it's going to make any difference. Um, I think there's, there's lots of moves that people can make, but what I, what I think is that the IRS did the best job that they really could have done under the circumstances, and we'll see how things move forward. So what does it do? Um, well, first it has a provision that is really designed based on, on your work here to deal with donor C4s and to try to say, can we get a handle on donor C4s? They may or may not have done that in a way that will work, but, um, but they certainly took a stab at it. And what they said is, if you're giving to a C4, that C4 must be exclusively engaged in social welfare. <laughs> you cannot do this multiplier effect by giving to a C4 and having it and keep going. If you're going to give to a C4 and have it count as social welfare, that C4 must be exclusively engaged in social welfare activities. Um, the other thing they did is they changed the way of looking at political intervention. And, and this is probably the most important part of 
I think the donor actually is the most important part, the, the second most important part of the red. Right now, what we have is this facts and circumstances test of political intervention. I think the people who work in this area know that groups have really been pushing that line and what that definition is. I think for most of us, it was pretty clear at least where the spectrum was, and they're way outside the spectrum. But, uh, but they at least had an argument, because a facts and circumstances test that's never enforced, it's pretty hard to figure out where the line is. So what the IRS did is came in with very clear-cut rules about what's going to happen. Um, and some people are going to complain that those rules are overbroad. My argument would be, no, I think they should be a little broad. And the argument is, as long as you're going to be allowed to do, as long as you're a social welfare organization, and you're allowed to do some politics, an overbroad definition is not so bad, because the idea was not for you to be a political entity. If you want to be a political entity, be a 527. So having a broader definition helps us ensure that what I call, oh, come on, activities don't go on, right? We all know you can do a nonpartisan voter registration drive, but besides the League of Women Voters, how many are there? Right? You can do a nonpartisan candidate voter guide, but really, I mean, we all see them. We all know what they are. And so what the IRS rule is saying is, voter guys, <coughs> get out the vote. Those are going to be what they now call candidate-related activities. And that's going to be the measure. So we have something that's very close to express advocacy. We have something that's close to electioneering communication. Um, you know, Right now, and I, I think both NPR and the center did work on this, groups are claiming that they, uh, to the FEC that they're engaged in politics, but to the IRS that they're not. That, that, that will be more difficult now. Um, and so, and then we have these other activities, as I said, that I call, oh, come on. And the other one, the one that I think is gonna get the most traction for being a little difficult is the candidate appearances, where they determine that if a candidate appears at an event, that's gonna be considered um, candidate advocacy. And you certainly have a lot of members who appear at a lot of events that don't necessarily have election content. So I think you're gonna see some pushback there, but we'll see. Um, and the other thing it does is, it, very interestingly, it invites consideration of what standard we should use for primary. And one of the reasons that at the moment I don't think these regs are going to be that hard is if you don't deal with that issue, what does it mean to be primarily involved in social welfare, you're going you're gonna to have a lot of abuse. So I, keeping to my time, what I'd say is I, I think this is a really good step. Uh, I think it's very helpful to open the dialogue. I am very skeptical that this step is going to change much of anything, except at least give us a standard by which we can operate. Um, I unfortunately or fortunately have a lot of faith in election lawyers to figure out how to gain the system further. And if C4s are closed, um, I already have a, a long list of, of mechanisms or ways that I think the groups will move to do this advocacy. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. But I think for those people who think that this is really going to be a game changer, uh, I just don't see it. So thank you. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I, I am uh, impressed uh, also by the center's uh, uh, work and efforts in the disclosure area. And, and as many of you or some of you may know, uh, I've uh, been involved in this uh, field professionally as a lawyer for quite a bit of time. I, I told someone earlier this morning that uh, I left a, a very energizing and pleasant career as a restaurant manager in Georgetown to go work for the Republican Party in 1975. Uh, and uh, uh, somewhat survived in 1974 a so-called post-Watergate election. And uh, they were down to 141 Republican members in the House of Representatives. And the chairman of the uh, committee at the, the House Campaign Committee had it as a uh, campaign slogan, 76 and 76 which was the number of seats they had to pick up in order to gain a majority in the House. And as 
some of you may know, we went down to one after the 76 election. Uh, but one of the reasons that they contacted me uh, at the restaurant was that I was a lawyer and I had worked in Republican politics. And uh, somebody over there noticed that the Congress had passed a campaign finance reform law. <clears throat> And they thought that they probably needed a lawyer for the first time in their 110 year existence to give them some legal advice. And uh, as a sign of the desperation of the party and its uh, very dire straits, uh, they hired a lawyer who's tending bar in Georgetown uh, to give them that advice. <coughs> so uh, as a result of that, I, uh, I, I attended the uh, arguments in Buckley versus Vallejo and uh, worked on the uh, legislation that uh, resulted after the uh, Supreme Court's decision. And of course, the notion of campaign finance, campaign finance reform at that time was a, a, an approach that essentially limited the entire universe of campaign spending. Uh, in fact, uh, spending limits was a major feature of, of that legislation. Uh, they had a limit of $90,000 that any candidate could spend per election on his or her entire campaign. And uh, there were other features uh, that were quite burdensome on the spending side. And then, of course, the introduction of contribution limits, as well as disclosure, public financing, and, and an independent enforcement agency, the Federal Election Commission, which went on to distinguish itself as being declared unconstitutionally composed not once but twice in Supreme Court decisions. Because the original can, uh, Federal Election Commission was composed of six members, uh, no more than three of any party. Uh, there were also two ex officio members, uh, a representative uh, from the House of Representatives, the clerk, and the uh, Secretary of the Senate. <coughs> and uh, the six commissioners were appointed, two by the White House, two by the Majority Leader of the Senate, two by the Speaker of the House. And all six had to be confirmed by a majority of both the House and the Senate. And anybody who's read the Constitution may have noticed that there's a provision that says that only the president can appoint executive agency personnel and only the Senate may confirm. So the Supreme Court had to straighten all that out. My point in uh, sort of setting out what campaign finance reform was back 40 years ago is that uh, we have uh, changed dramatically and we're basically now focusing on disclosure, which is a result of <clears throat> the evolution of law, uh, a lot of Supreme Court decisions, and uh, a recognition that uh, the original concepts of reform uh, either don't work or they're unconstitutional. And we now have a process which is essentially a bifurcated system. Uh, on the one half of the equation here, we have uh, candidates and political parties, and they operate under these remaining quaint rules that uh, they can only collect money in certain limited amounts for candidates, it's $2,600 per election. Uh, for political parties, it's a little higher. But they can only get them from individuals and, or other types of political committees that are registered with the Federal Election Commission. And I, I sort of equate that as you know, trying to fill up your suburban SUV with a thimble. You know? That's how you're going to run your campaign or your party. And then on the other side of the equation, uh, we have uh, a variety of organizations that can collect money from any source, corporations and unions, in any amount, and they can spend it in the campaign as long as they do so without collaborating with those candidates and political parties over there. That's the system today. And in preparing for this morning and talking with Vivica and others, uh, I thought it would be helpful to perhaps uh, place uh, the discussion we're having regarding these tax-exempt groups and the IRS and so-called dark money in the context of what's happening in this strange system that we have uh, currently and, and how do they fit in. And I thought it would be helpful perhaps to uh, go through uh, our experience at least since the 2000 election. Now, where do I move things along? Here we go. Uh, I have a, a handful of charts. I, I will try not to belabor them, but I, I will I think they are meaningful in terms of uh, uh, telling us, you know, where is money coming from, how is it being spent, and who's doing it in, in this system that I just described. And uh, here we have the fundraising, and, and this data is uh, based on uh, 
Federal Election Commission records and, and the center's uh, records. Uh, had a couple of associates uh, compile this information last fall, and, and I think it's relatively accurate, and I'm sure I will be told if it's not, <laughs> and then we'll make corrections. But uh, we have here on the fundraising side these groups, uh, candidates, parties, PACs, 527 organizations, super PACs. The reason they're listed here is because <clears throat> these are the organizations that have to disclose where their money is coming from. And uh, I, I just would point out a couple of uh, trends. Uh, as you can see from the bar graphs, and we'll get to the numbers in a moment, uh, obviously the, the folks that are raising the most money are the candidates, which is somewhat reassuring, right? And, and the trend line is relatively steep. And of course, the reason it uh, kind of goes up and down is it depends on whether it's a presidential election or a non-presidential election. So in a non-presidential election year, as we are having next year, uh, we don't have presidential candidates, and therefore the amount of money raised by candidates is going to be lower. But nonetheless, that trend line is also pretty consistently up, <clears throat> and, and, a, and a very positive, steep trend line. Political parties, on the other hand, uh, kind of bumped up a little bit in 2004, and I'll explain why. Uh, and you can see that they're kind of languishing there. They're kind of flat. <clears throat> they might go up a little bit in their fundraising. This all the Democratic and, and Republican Party fundraising. And then uh, we have these uh, other groups. PACs are what I call the traditional PACs. All right? so these are the union PACs, the non-connected PACs, the trade associations, <coughs> corporate PACs. They're the ones uh, who raise money in, in that uh, closed system in limited amounts and they disclose it from individuals and so forth. And then we have the so-called 527s. Uh, there's already been a reference to the 2004 election, which I refer to as the George Soros Swift vote election. Uh, I'll explain why they popped up, up there in a moment. And uh, they kind of declined. But on the other hand, we've got these super PACs, which is a relatively recent phenomenon. Now, in terms of the numbers, you can see that uh, it's fairly significant. We're talking about C4s and C5s and C6s, and I think the number of about 300 million was uh, thrown around. Uh, you've got to put that in the context of the rest of the money that has been raised under this disclosed system, $7.2 billion. Now, <clears throat> That C tax exempt money, of course, doesn't show up in this chart because they're not disclosing their fundraising sources. Uh, so let's go to the spending side. And you'll see from the bar graph that it's uh, comparable to what I had just displayed for, with respect to the fundraising. But now we're introducing the C4, the tax exempt groups, because uh, it, notwithstanding they don't disclose where they might get their money because they're unions or trade associations and so forth, they do have to report with the Federal Election Commission when they spend it uh, for purposes of independent expenditures or election communications. And uh, they have started to pop up. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been around a little bit, but we, we're getting a pretty uh, major spike, excuse me, over here. Too many uh, shades of blue that I'm confusing here. But let's go to the numbers uh, because this is, uh, tells you what they're spending, uh, and are, I'm reassured that my figures are relatively consistent with yours, uh, $335 million. These are your C4s, your labor unions, which, by the way, divert some of their spending into super PACs, which I'll disclose in a while here, so uh, and I'll explain why. Uh, but the, they, they constitute about 4.5% of all the money that was spent in the 2012 election under the $7.34 billion. Now, some of this money is double counted because the spending, for example, by traditional PACs uh, is mostly, but not entirely, mostly in the form of, well, we're going to spend money by making contributions to whom? We're going to make contributions to the candidates. So the money kind of shows up uh, you know, redundantly. Uh, so I don't know what the actual figure ultimately would be. Now, <clears throat> on this chart, uh, I just want to point out that uh, in 2000, 2002, when uh, analyzing the money that political parties raised or spend, uh, we had a uh, distinction between the so-called 
hard money, which is the money that's raised under those quaint rules, you know, no more than X amount of money from individuals and other registered PACs. And then we had soft money, which was money that came in uh, basically unlimited amounts from unions and corporations and individuals. And as you will note, uh, in both 2000 and 2002, uh, there was approximately $500 million raised and spent in that fashion by the political parties, almost equally divided, almost exactly equally divided between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, about $250 million each. And that money, of course, disappeared in 2004 because the McCain-Feingold bill was passed, and uh, that money could no longer be raised or spent by the parties. And then, lo and behold, you know, let's go down to the 527 column. And what happened? Well, we had almost $450 million in the so-called 527 money. And just as was predicted by the professor uh, after the enactment of the 527 disclosure provisions where money uh, migrated from 527 organizations to tax exempt organizations uh, in the campaign finance arena, uh, a comparable uh, uh, you know, tide of money went from the parties into 527 organizations. And that continued, uh, but at a declining rate, to the point where really today these 527s are primarily the Republican Governors Association and the Democratic Governors Association. They still use that tax vehicle and report the money uh, because they're involved in state elections. And they can raise money as a tax exempt political organization from corporations, from unions, because 28 states allow corporate or, uh, uh, contributions. Uh, 43 states allow some form of union labor money in their state and local elections. And of course, all of the states uh, permit uh, party organizations and anybody else to spend money independently. And that's what the, these governors associations do today. Back in 2000 and 2002, they did it through the parties. They, they were part of the so-called soft money operation. So the 527s have migrated and declined in that fashion. Then we have the super PACs, which uh, were a function of the Citizens United decision. And the C4 organizations, as uh, Professor Philbin indicated, uh, they start uh, you know, increasing in 2004 and have steadily increased their spending in this area through 2012. Uh, the lessons that I, I think we can uh, discern from this uh, information is that, uh, first of all, uh, while there are significant amounts of money being raised and spent by uh, so-called dark money sources, uh, they are not the primary uh, participant, even in, when it comes to so-called independent spending. Obviously, a whole lot more money is showing up in the super PACs. Of course, part of that may be a, a contortion uh, because it was a presidential year, and uh, as I'll show in a moment, uh, a lot of these super PACs and spending was geared towards presidential campaigns, and not other campaigns. And, <clears throat> but we see that money migrates. And it, it migrates as a result of changes in the law, whether it's legislative or uh, constitutional decisions of the Supreme Court. Uh, money migrated after the enactment of the McCain-Feingold law. And as a, an attorney who did represent uh, uh, Senator McConnell uh, in his opposition to the legislation and in his case before the Supreme Court, uh, I can tell you that I and many others predicted when the legislation was being considered in Congress that you ban the soft money, it's going to go somewhere else. You're promoting as a matter of policy, if you want to do this, and it's constitutional, you can ban soft money to the parties, it's going to go somewhere else. And as a policy matter, is that a good idea that we want to divert money that we know is going to be in the process away from more accountable institutions that are fully disclosing where their money's coming from. That's what used to be the situation before we came final. We see with the Wisconsin Right to Life case, 
uh, that there was a you know, First Amendment decision that uh, basically recognized that there was, even before Citizens United, certain spending uh, that was constitutionally protected uh, when uh, engaged in by corporations and unions. And then, of course, after Citizens United, uh, it ratified that there really couldn't be any sort of uh, restrictions in terms of limiting or prohibiting that type of spending. And after each instance, we see different participants sort of increasing their participation in avenues other than money going to political parties. So let's uh, take a look in 2012 as to, you know, who were the big spenders? <coughs> now we're worried about who the underschools big spenders are. Well, here, here are the, and by underschools, I mean, they're disclosing their spending, but they're not disclosing, you know, where they're getting their money. Uh, 12 of the top 20 non-party big spenders were super PACs. They registered with the FEC, they disclosed where the money is coming from, and they report the fact that they're spending their money. You then have a, a couple of additional uh, variations here. Uh, interestingly, the unions, uh, some of the unions, ASME, uh, Service Employees Union, they had a super PAC. Connected organization PAC. Now, uh, somebody earlier said, well, you know, we don't worry about the unions, they, you know, we can consider them to disclose. Well, uh, I, I won't get into all the details of why I think that is subject to argument, but unions, of course, have lots of individual members who pay union dues. Uh, the analog on the association side is the National Association of Realtors. They have a lot of realtors all over the country. They pay dues. <clears throat> now, after the Citizens United case, uh, and in consideration of tax laws, uh, these tax exempt organizations, unions and associations, said, well, we, want to, we now have a constitutional right to spend more money directly. But if we spend money directly as a tax exempt organization for uh, undisputed political activity, campaign activity, I would use there uh, it might be subject to a 35% tax because under Section 527, for tax exempt organizations, if they spend money for undisputed campaign purposes, they may have to pay the tax because they're tax exempt. So, uh, what these organizations did is, well, we're going to continue collecting money from our members. Uh, when they pay the dues, we're going to designate $5 or whatever, some amount of money, to our PAC. And we'll treat that as a direct donation from our members to the PAC. Therefore, we are still collecting the money from our base. We are avoiding a 35% tax on, on the spending by the union or the association because the money is going directly to the PAC. The PAC is registered with the FEC and disclosing its spending and its, uh, uh, and, and its fundraising. Uh, you will see that the C4s and C6s uh, are here. Uh, some of them, you know, may have a limited purpose. We'll, we'll see they are continuing to raise money or attempting to, I think, with considerably less success than they did in 2011, 2012. But those are your folks. The Chamber of Commerce, which, by the way, raises you know, and spends in its activities probably over $200 million, right? Well, so they got $32 million in so-called reportable expenses, not all of which are necessarily treated as campaign related because uh, a lot of uh, lobbying and grassroots activity may trigger disclosure, but not necessarily required currently uh, to be treated as uh, campaign related. In fact, uh, a lot of C4s devote significant amounts of money, and in some cases all of their money, to lobbying. Why social welfare does include lobbying. It's within the tax exempt function of these tax exempt groups. And they're pretty significant. You know, names you will recognize the National Rifle Association, the Sierra Club, those are your C4s, uh, as well as big trade associations and chambers of commerce. Now, when you add in the political parties, by the way, they're also big spenders. They report. And uh, if you recompose the top 20 list, well, you 
going to have five political parties who are going to be in the top 20 list, the five political party committees. The only one that's missing here is the Democratic National Committee, but between that committee and the Obama campaign, they raised $1 billion. So they didn't need to uh, do independent expenditures. They did other stuff with their money, apparently, maybe uh, contributed to I know they contributes a lot of money to the DCCC and the SEC as well. So, and then finally, uh, you know, who are some of the top donors to the uh, super PACs? They're the ones who do disclose where the money's coming from. <clears throat> and uh, you'll see some familiar names here. Uh, individuals, unions, uh, one type of entity that's really missing is uh, business corporations. Certainly no public company is a top contributor to super PACs. There is uh, speculation uh, that uh, perhaps they are donating some of that money to those dark money uh, repositories. Uh, it's certainly possible, but uh, when it comes to the public corporate community, uh, I think the vast majority of those companies have taken on policies that prohibit funding independent spending, uh, and if they do uh, any sort of financing of independent spending, they have incorporated policies of disclosing where uh, they're giving their money. Uh, most of the money, the vast majority of the money, is obviously coming from well-to-do individuals, labor unions. And occasionally privately held companies. There's an entity here, number nine, especially Group Inc. Uh, that's actually owned by one individual. It's a closely held corporation. And for whatever reason, that individual made donations which were reported in that fashion. So that's, uh, that's those are the numbers. I think that uh, my closing comment is that uh, in, in some ways, after witnessing how concepts of reform have had to change uh, to accommodate uh, uh, changes in, in the system, Supreme Court decisions that uh, uh, in some respects, some members of the reform community, my view, are still uh, midway through the uh, five stages of grieving you know, death. You know, that, uh, first of all, there was denial, uh, then there's anger, you know, the president standing in front of the Supreme Court. Citizens United, how dare you do that? Uh, we're somewhere between uh, bargaining and depression right now. We're not anywhere near acceptance. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there's so much less that can be done to regulate and fine tune the process because of all of these developments in the last 40 years. Uh, at some point, we have to accept what the legal restrictions and constitutional restrictions are and ask, well, what do we want to focus on? You know, sure, we want to focus on disclosure. That, that's great. That's a, you know, and there's a lot of latitude there. It's not open-ended. You can't have ambiguous disclosure. You can't have overbroad dis disclosure. You know, we uh, at my firm uh, have, have made a living uh, partly by suing states that have very vague ambiguous, overly broad disclosure laws. <clears throat> you know, in fact, we just finished a case in West Virginia, and every time we get an injunction from a federal court, the West Virginia legislature was summoned to change the law. And then the change law was unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. We got another injunction. And uh, they, I don't know what they're going to do next, but at some point, they can actually draft a clear, unambiguous, not overly broad disclosure law of some sort, and that's going to be the system. Uh, but the other thing to keep in mind when reviewing uh, reform proposals, I think, is, well, how is it going to affect the entire system? You know, was it really a good idea to prohibit soft money, disclosed contributions to political parties? Especially when, as I said, you know, 28 states allow corporate money in their system. 43 states allow union money in their system. We're across the river from... Commonwealth of Virginia. It doesn't have any restrictions on where money comes from and in what amount as long as it's disclosed. And as a result, <coughs> uh, we may not like some of the con contributors, we may 
know who they are, and the candidates can operate in that, in that fashion, and the public has that awareness. And I would also point out that, uh, you know, historically, Virginia has had a history of uh, candidates coming from very modest economic uh, and social backgrounds, winning elections to the governorship, because they can go around and get whatever support they needed to undertake a campaign and, uh, and, and be successful. Uh, so when, 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 when folks are evaluating what to do next in disclosure or in other areas, I would hope that based on our experience that they will take into account the consequences of whatever proposals they seek to enact. Thank you. Until, until CRP made this database, there was always a sense that there was money moving around within the C4 universe, but we didn't really have a handle on, on, on the extent of it. Uh, we knew that C4 spending had gone up 8,000% between uh, uh, the 2004 election and the 2012 election. But, uh, but we didn't know about the, what turned out to be fairly complex internal networks uh, of, of money flow among the C4s. Uh, what we did to, to make the story was uh, we started with the database and files of 990s and uh, Robert McGuire's incredible memory. And we started mapping out things uh, you know, connections we're using whiteboard uh, in a conference room at NPR. And we filled one wall of the thing with a map showing uh, the flow of, uh, of C4 money in Ohio. And then <coughs> it, it looked really interesting, but it, it journalistically speaking, it wasn't, it, it was a hard story to tell. So then we uh, started looking at at Wellspring, which we knew was a, a pass-through organization and you know kind of a mid-sized operation compared to say the Center for uh, Center to Protect Patient Rights. But uh, Wellspring had seemed active in a lot of different ways, and so we started mapping that out, and that's uh, that's the story that we wound up with. We mapped that out on another wall in this conference room, which, which we have not erased yet. So all of the conference, conference room. Uh, and just journalistically speaking, the, the NPR version of the story and the, uh, the CRP version of the story are a good example of the difference between broadcast and print journalism. Um, uh, CRP laid out pretty much the whole network, uh, talked about the, uh, the woman who runs Wellspring, Ann Corkery, who wouldn't talk to us, by the way, um, uh, talks about her background and how um, she and her husband have connections to a lot of social conservative groups. And Wellspring didn't exactly fit that mold because on their um, uh, 
here, 1024 applications to see course status, they, uh, they frame the group's mission in terms of promoting uh, free enterprise system and, uh, and basically governmental support for, this, for the free enterprise system. So, uh, so this was in some ways a, a departure, seemed to be a departure of Portland from what they've been doing previously. Um, so, so the, the CRP story lays all that out in a way that if I tried to do it on the radio, you all would have tuned out in the first 90 seconds. There are too many group names, too many, too many lines to describe, and it wouldn't have worked. So the radio version takes this one small slice of the story, narrows it down to something tangible that, that happened um, that seemed to involve wellspring money. Uh, it, it was an environmental case in Michigan that, reflected, that affected the, one of the best fly fishing spots in the state. So the upshot was that I got to go fly fishing with the head of the, the president of the anglers of the Osabo River, the conservation group who was fighting the, um, the environmental case. They won the case at the state Supreme Court. The guy, the justice who uh, wrote the opinion in their favor lost his election bid. He got judicial elections in there too. Uh, partly because of, uh, of an attack ad financed by a group that got money from Wellspring. And so, it, and then the state Supreme Court reversed the decision. So, you have money raised by a group based in Manassas that is going to affect a river in central Michigan. And this, I, I thought this was a pretty good example of how, how politics works nowadays. So, um, so, so that's how we, the two ways we present the story, and then we have the, the graphics. Um, Robert showed you one of the, uh, the five pages of the graphic on the Yantara website. Uh, how Wellspring, you know, the, the money that Wellspring sent to other groups, uh, the money that flowed back, you know, flowed among those groups because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of sloshing around among them, circling back and forth. Uh, the money that Wellspring gave to, uh, to groups in state judicial elections, which is a su substantial part of their activity. And then the last slide was the money that we could identify that went to Wellspring, which is about $250,000 out of the $24 million they raised. So this is the, the other thing about the, uh, the uh, money moving within the, the networks of C4. Ultimately, you come to the dead end where the money enters the system. You don't know you know, the individuals, corporations, unions, whatever, that gave initially to the C4, that, that gave it to the second C4, the first C4, etc. Um, all of this, by the way, would seem to be shut down if the IRA, I mean, the, IRA if the IRS gets its way on, the, um, on its uh, C4 proposals. Uh, their provision on on pass-through activity is that if the donor group does any political activity, then the money from the donor, sorry, the recipient group does any donor activity, does any political activity, then the donor group's gift to it would count as political activity regardless of what actually happened to that so uh, it, it kind of reverses the cleansing operation that you talk 
talked about where the, the uh, social welfare purpose of the money gets amplified as it goes along. This is amplified the, uh, the political activity of the money as it goes along. I have no idea what the future of that proposal is. And, um, I look forward to watching that. But, um, so the other thing I want to talk about is disclosure, because um, the whole point of the C4s is, <coughs> uh, is to avoid disclosure. Otherwise, they'd be 527s. And um, we are uh, just in the past few years galloping away from what used to be conventional wisdom on the uh, the conservative stand on uh, on political money that uh, you have no limits put into the disclosure. Uh, now the, the growing argument is that uh, disclosure is a dangerous thing, that uh, there is ample evidence to prove it, and that it really needs to be reconsidered. Um, uh, you know, the, the conservative groups are building records of uh, harassment and intimidation that they face. Um, they say it's all aimed at conservatives and Tea Party groups. Um, I'm not, I, I've seen some examples that go the other way, but, uh, you know, not, nothing has been aired in court yet, so we don't have, uh, we don't have really solid evidence on it. Um, a lot of the, the arguments they make is framed around the idea that the Obama administration is, uh, is targeting especially Tea Party groups for uh, the IRS blow up uh, last spring being a prime example of that. Um, I felt covering the thing that there was, uh, it, there's a lot of good evidence in there and there's also a lot of, uh, lot of hyperbole. I thought that uh, some of the things that about looked an awful lot like the questions on the 1024 form, which is incredibly intrusive by, by most standards. You, know, you apply for uh, 501c4 status and the IRS wants to know, um, you know how much do you plan to raise for the next three years? What are your plans for the, for the next three years? What are you going to spend on them? Uh, how long are they going to take? Just all, all sorts of things that um, you know, I, if, if I were a small grassroots leader thinking about trying to get tax exemption, uh, you know, I, I'd be kind of taken aback by this. Um, the, <clears throat> there's certainly a heightened level of uh, vituperative debate these days. Um, you know, there, uh, like the um, the Tea Party Leadership Fund at the uh, FEC last week, trying to uh, get exemption from disclosure. They pointed to a, I think it was a 1,500 page submission that they had <coughs> of clips of uh, things where the Tea, where tea Party <coughs> groups had been singled out for criticism. Um, a lot of it was um, uh, Democrats in Congress railing against the Tea Party, comparing, making unflattering comparisons to them. And I'm not sure where the line is between uh, unpleasant debate and harassment and intimidation there. Um, I also. Um, had a discussion this week with a, a guy from the think tank who's arguing that actually disclosure, I said, well, you know, it seems like there's some common ground on disclosure. For instance, you could raise the threshold for hard money contributions to um, $1,000, say. And he said, but 
it's not the small donors that need the protection, it's the big donors that need protection because they have the most at stake when they give money. And, uh, you know, we sort of bypass the, uh, the corruption argument that, that the Supreme Court used in Buckley. Um, but, uh, you know, I thought it was a novel argument. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so maybe I'm, I'm not up with the times on this, but um, it, it surprised me. Uh, the, all of this goes back to two, two basic cases, I think. And I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this as a reporter and sort of a watcher of the political scene, not a lawyer. And um, so, uh, you know, there may be. This ain't legal advice. Um, the, the one case is the NAACP versus Alabama. And, uh, for instance, Carl Rove was on the Fox News during the campaign comparing <coughs> groups, conservative groups, to the NAACP in this case. They shouldn't have to um, uh, identify their donors because of, um, because of the threat of harassment and intimidation. Well, in Alabama, uh, NAACP members' houses and churches were being firebombed routinely. Um, after the bus boycott, snipers were uh, shooting some of the buses. Um, they tried to desegregate the University of, University of Alabama. That's also part of the court case. Uh, the woman who uh, tried to enroll was chased across the campus by a mob shouting, let's kill her. Um, it seems like we're a long way to go before we get to that stage. Um, the other case is the Socialist Workers Party, and the, uh, or they get an exemption from disclosure from the FEC over a few years. And the argument there basically is that the government has no compelling interest in, uh, in corruption because the Socialist Workers Party is so inconsequential that they can't corrupt anything. And so, you know, somewhere between those, we have an issue of disclosure uh, perhaps being different now because of the internet, because of things like the um, group in uh, California that made a map showing the homes of donors to uh, uh, the Prop 8 resolution against gay marriage. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very young argument, and I, um, I'm waiting to see when it, when it really starts getting serious. I'm going to start by um, thanking you all for being here. And um, we didn't have a sign-up sheet on when you, when you came in, but if you could sign up on your way out, that would be really helpful to us. We promise not to harass you. Um, but I was hoping one of our staff could get the legal pad, maybe, from out front. And, uh, and we could have you sign up on the way out. We appreciate it. Um, I'm trying to... Uh, end things here by looking forward. And I'd like to start by saying that if I could predict the future, I'd spend half my time at the track and the other half at my big pool, at my big house somewhere in France. Um, but uh, I guess if you care enough about non-disclosure that you have gone to the trouble to create a C4 in the first place, um, you're not going to stand still as scrutiny ramps up. Um, and let's face it, there are some warning signs for groups that are operating in this space. One being the IRS rules that we've heard about, uh, the proposed rules. Um, one is that states are getting more aggressive about trying to pierce the non-disclosure veil. California recently brought a somewhat successful case against uh, a couple of groups. There were 
uh, last year, several groups passing money through uh, one another to get them into a campaign for one ballot initiative and against another ballot initiative in California. Um, the Center to Protect Patients' Rights, Patient Rights, and Americans for Responsible Leadership wound up uh, being fined a total of a million dollars in that case, which was a record fine for the state agency. And the names of some of the donors to Americans for Job Security, which is a C6 that was participating in this scheme, um, were released. So New York State, other states are also active in, in trying to uh, get the disclosure that the feds don't um, seem to be acting on or feel that they can't act on. Um, the IRS regs won't be in place for the 2014 elections, maybe for the 2016 elections, although I think we can expect lawsuits that may delay that. Um, but you've also got groups like ours that have been combing through the 990s, putting together databases, able to map out some of the networks and kind of shedding a little light on, on this world. It's not quite, the, the dark money is not quite as dark as it used to be. Um, so given that there's all this activity, what will things look like going forward? Well, even before the recent events have put the nonprofits on notice, um, there were efforts by these groups to go beyond the simple C4 structure to hide the ball, and this, this occurred on both sides of the aisle. Um, Robert, how do we get to you? Your yes. Okay, so on the, uh, on the liberal side, Citizens for Strength and Security and Patriot Majority USA have gone through a lot of shape-shifting. Um, Citizens for Strength and Security has had several names over the years and has taken several forms, uh, 501c4s, 527s, even a super PAC. Um, Patriot Majority, that cluster has also included 527s, c4s, and a super PAC. Um, its c4 has been killed off twice, only to miraculously come back again. And uh, uh, Money went from one arm of the group into grants to two other separate C4s, then was given by them to Patriot Majority's 527 account. Um, in 2011, Patriot Majority USA filed a termination report, but that same year, another Patriot Majority USA C4 started up using the same name, the same PO box, the same board. Um, that most recent re um, iteration of the group spent millions on independent expenditures in the 2012 election. Okay. And on the conservative side, a good example is American Commitment, which has gone through at least three incarnations, all of them started by Sean Noble, who also started the Center to Protect Patient Rights, which is, uh, he, he's been active with the Koch Network for, for quite some time. And Center to Protect Patient Rights, of course, is one of the big pass-throughs that has given away tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to politically active C4s. So I don't think there's much doubt that the gymnastics of these groups um, has been designed to confuse, confuse the public, confuse the regulatory agencies, and sometimes to stay on the right side of the letter of the law, if not the spirit of the law. Um, also, you have the... Uh, disregarded entity game. Um, so the C4s have been mixing these wholly owned LLC subsidiaries into the picture, which are called disregarded entities by the IRS. Um, and they can be the recipients of grants from other groups, but the grants are really going to the parent C4s. So this shows some of them, Americans for Prosperity, the probably the most well-known Koch-linked group, PRDIST LLC, you know, it's Took us a while to figure figure that out when we first ran into that. But uh, uh, Corner Table LLC, American Commitment LLC, Eleventh Edition LLC, all of them are the Center to Protect Patient Rights. Uh, Generation Opportunity, um, which you may have seen running ads, uh, encouraging young people not to get health insurance, uh, not to sign up for Obamacare. 
FEMA's trust is the uh, Coates Voter Database Effort, also known as STN LLC. And then Freedom Partners Chamber of Commerce, they've got the American Entrepreneur Fund, American Enterprise Group, American Strategic Innovations, American Strategies Group, all sound kind of similar, um, but they're all, they're all actually Freedom Partners. So Freedom Partners actually burst onto the scene in 2012, but it wasn't public until this year. Um, and that's a C6, a co-played C6, and it gave out $236 million in 2012, a lot of it to disregard identities. Uh, for instance, $125 million to Corner Table LLC, which is the Center to Protect Patient Rights. Um, and by the way, CPPRs, disregarded entities, change their names every year just to make it even harder. And uh, Corner Table LLC is now <coughs> excuse me, now called Cactus Wren LLC, as we know from their latest 990. So, uh, so what's next? Um, we certainly could see more of these same sorts of tactics, using disregarded entities that change their names a lot, starting new C4s and disbanding them and coming back to life, being constantly in motion and hard to keep up with. Um, we know that some C4s, though, seem to be on the wane. Wellspring, which uh, we wrote about with NPR, um, wasn't very active last year. In 2010, it was extremely active. And uh, we've heard that the Center to Protect Patient Rights is a little out of favor right now in the COPE network and maybe less of a big hub than it has been. Um, Freedom Partners is a C6, not a C4. And that's a structure that doesn't require any pretense of having a social welfare purpose. And even allows some tax de deductibility of contributions. We might see more of the C6 structure. Um, unless, of course, the IRS applies new regulations to C6s as well, which is something it's invited comment on. Um, but, uh, you know, what, one factor, as I mentioned, is the states, and if states become more aggressive about trying to pierce the veil, then you may see the nonprofit structure go out of favor entirely, the C6s included. Um, we could see more independent expenditures coming directly from the LLCs, not as part of the C4s, but just independently. Um, we could see regular for-profit uh, corporations created just for this purpose, spending money on independent expenditures. Um, and I kind of wonder if we've seen the heyday of the C4 politically active organization. Um, and, and the fact is we don't really know what the strategists will come up with, but there is a huge pool of money out there that can be used for politics um, that, where people don't want their names associated with it. So there's going to be a desire for non-disclosure, and there's going to be a lot of lawyers working on new structures to assure that. And I think, you know, Jan's point earlier is true, the money in politics never really goes away. It just shows up in a different form, with spiffy new clothes and a little nip and tuck here and there. Um, and that's been proven over and over. So what we do know is there will be a lot of work for lawyers in the coming years, and a lot of work for we reporters and researchers trying to track it down. Although, I have to say, when it comes to shifting it away from uh, the nonprofits, we're gonna have even less luck tracking it down than we have. So, I think that wraps it up, and we will go to questions from you guys, I think. Bob Weinberger, our board chair, is going to come up and moderate the questions. Thanks. Thank you, Vivica, and thank you all for being here. Um, we have some time for questions, so uh, questions for our panel. Hi. Um, this question has to do with the IRS regulations. I believe the National Taxpayer Advocate, in its report after the IRS scandal, it said one way to approach these groups uh, and the IRS's role in monitoring them is to take the IRS out of the business altogether and just let the FEC be the one who decides whether groups are political or not. And I wanted to invite some comment or reaction to that thought. Did everyone hear the question? Okay. 
Well, I, I'll be glad to start. Uh, might be the IRS there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. I tell you what, let's see if we can turn this off. It's beautiful. Uh, you know, the, the fundamental problem here is the fact that legislative efforts to address this issue fail. I mean, the proper way to address uh, the problem of disclosure, if that is what we all agree is the so-called problem, is to pass a law that uh, fills in a current void. It's what happened with uh, the 527 organizations in 2000. Right? The IRS didn't get involved in new rulemaking or anything like that. Uh, Congress passed a law and, and addressed uh, disclosure of those types of vehicles. Congress attempted to pass a law, uh, the so-called Disclose Act, after the Citizens United uh, decision. Uh, in part, they were unsuccessful because uh, they sought to do more than required disclosure. They larded up the legislation with a new variety of perceived reforms that were going to really have a goal of not so much disclosure, but to repress this type of activity. And in doing so, uh, they basically split uh, any possible coalition to pass the legislation. In fact, they had to put in an amendment into this bill to exempt organizations like the National Rifle Association, which didn't want to be subjected to uh, so many of these proposed restrictions that were in that legislation. So when that failed, what we have seen uh, are a variety of attempts to get other avenues of uh, accomplishing the, this goal through independent agencies, not just the IRS, not just the Federal Election Commission, but also the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, all of these agencies, other than the FEC, really are not in the business of accomplishing campaign finance disclosure. They have other mandates. Uh, and I, I think that there ought to really be another attempt uh, at some point to do the right thing, which is to accomplish the goal legislatively, uh, which is the uh, direct legal and, and hopefully constitutional way to do it. Now, you know, part, part of the problem was that it wasn't just disclosure. Even when you're just focusing on disclosure, you've got to pass a law that meets other constitutional considerations. It cannot be vague. It cannot be overbroad. It cannot discriminate uh, unreasonably between who discloses and who doesn't disclose. Uh, so it, it's not an easy process, but it is the way to do uh, what people are proposing to do. So um, I think most people who look at this would love for uh, the IRS not to be involved in political activity. I think the IRS would prefer not to be involved in political activity. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons that the IRS has been reluctant to enforce. It's not an agency well designed to handle this. And for those of us who do tax and actually believe we'd like to someday have a balanced budget and have a tax system that works, having the IRS have to be involved in these things both distracts it from its core mission and also has it lose credibility in its core mission. So I think most people would really prefer the IRS not to have to do this. With that said, there, there's a law, and the IRS should enforce the law, and it should create guidelines that help you enforce the law in a, in a clear way. So it's, it's really easy to say, let's not be involved in politics, but then when you look at what they're supposed to do, it gets harder. So a C3 is not allowed to intervene in a political campaign for or against a candidate. Um, what does that mean? We've seen lots of people claim what they do is education when it really doesn't seem like education to me. What is partisan education versus nonpartisan education? Right? There's a whole set of guidelines that you have to kind of go through to figure that out. Uh, what is issue advocacy? What is talking about an issue? Uh, you know, nonprofits are allowed to talk about issues. C3s are allowed to talk about issues, but we could talk about issues in a way that's very tied to a candidate. So it's, it's really easy to say the IRS shouldn't be involved in politics, but there's a lot of ways in which they're forced to do that in the exempt organization area. Now, there's some people who claim we should pull the whole exempt organization division out of the IRS, and, and that would 
Um, certainly less in some of these decisions, but it would, of course, also make it harder to have the exempt organization division talk with the rest of the IRS. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a, difficult, um, a difficult way to move forward in figuring out what, what to do in this area. Um, but I, what I think needs to happen is we, when, we, when we try to regulate by entity, when we try to regulate by 527 or C4 or C3, we, we're usually unsuccessful. Entity-based entity -based regulation is difficult because, of course, there's a lot of other entities out there. And entity-based regulation is what has been really charged to the IRS. And so we're, we're far better off if we have most of these decisions made uh, outside of the IRS and in, in an environment that uh, is, is meant for it. You know, we also have these problems on the IRS side with what we refer to as 6103, but which is really having to protect taxpayer information. And I think that's often used as both the shield and a sword. Um, and so um, there's a lot of institutional reasons why the IRS is not a good place for this. But they're, they've been stuck with it. And so I, I want to I wanna make clear, because I think they get beat up a lot and, and they have a very difficult time defending themselves. They didn't ask for this, right? This was, this is, these are requirements that are put into the code that require the IRS to do certain things. And the answer when you don't like something is not just not to do it. The answer is to do it and do it in the best way you can. And so I think these regs are an effort to do what they're supposed to do in the best way they can. It's a starting of trying to do that. Uh, so. Do, do you think these regs will produce disclosure? They don't even address disclosure, do they? So, so, so it's a backwards way of addressing a problem. <coughs> the problem, we think, is disclosure. The, and the, the objective uh, that can only be accomplished uh, through this regulation is to make it more difficult for these types of organizations to operate politically, but it, it has no effect on disclosure. Well, it may not. I, I mean, I, I, I generally am in your position that it has very little of impact on disclosure. Um, I think it may have an impact on fraud, and I think it may have an impact on um, Groups who claim one thing and are doing another. Because sure. I do I think I that. think the rules are much. But the goal here. More bright. Well, the goal for the goal reform where, is well, disclosure. Right? Okay, so so, so, to do that. so we have right. We have lots of different goals. Um, the goal here for some people may be disclosure. Um, I also would like an IRS that works. I would like well, well, rules that are clear. That'll take a lot more effort. I would like <laughs> rules that are, are clear and fair. Um, let me uh, let me take some a cluster of questions. Uh, uh, Michael Beckel from the Center. For system and uh, sort of one uh, particular vehicle that has come up a little bit, there was the uh, American Tradition Partnership or Western Tradition Partnership in Montana, which ran uh, a media-like uh, communications. A member of Congress recently ran media-like communications. And Citizens United even you know, went a step to say that it was going to be a more media-oriented or media-focused nonprofit. If that was on your list. Uh, I'm curious about uh, more partisan media being part of the election process or electoral arena, and what other uh, vehicles uh, are on the list in addition to that. Let me take a couple more and we'll answer them together. We have some back. In terms of lobbying, with um, 501c4, in terms of lobbying for 501c4s, uh, I guess I have two questions. One is how will the new IRS Why is it that some of these groups, from your perspective, why is it that some of these groups give away um, all or most of their money and then to other groups and then 
gave away all or most of their money to other groups and then give you know, the money um, away instead of actually just using the money to do the work they want to do, why give it away? Okay. Who wants to lead off? Want to start with that question? I, I assume they want to disguise the source of the money. I don't know. chain of organizations, and it looks like they're basically trying to uh, disguise what, what the original source of the money is. Are there any tax advantages? Any of the no. No, I, I think Robert probably hit on, I don't know the reason I don't advise these groups. Um, they, they wouldn't hire me. Um, <laughs> but um, I think you have this multiplier effect. There was concern about whether I'm doing enough social welfare, so that it looks like that there's a real advantage with the multiplier effect. And then I think uh, there's a, it makes it harder to trace, just period. And then I do think, but we haven't really, I haven't been able to come to grips with this, so I'm hypothesizing about what the concerns are about state law and state regulation. That, you know, the more, the more layers they can put in makes it harder depending on how states try to pierce bails. So I think there's some state advantages um, that may be coming up. You know, and I think when you're talking about media companies, you're really talking about people who are going to claim almost to be a news organization or a newspaper and try to get those kind of exceptions. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, not bad. Um, harder to target particular areas, but I certainly could see people trying to, to move in that way. Um, I, I'm i still, uh, you know, I, I joke about the fact that I've gotten tenure and promoted on one issue for my whole career. Um, and so I think pre-Citizens United, I wrote an article about the use of taxable entities as the next loophole. Um, and with Citizens United, I think the, the taxable entities will be even more of a loophole. Um, exactly that? Well, I just form a, I can form a C Corp. Okay. And um, your contributions to the C Corp might be contributions to capital, so not taxed. They might be gifts under the $14,000 limit. If you have a really large uh, you know, million dollar person, I might give you stock in exchange. So I, I think I can, I think I could maybe use them. And now that the C Corps can engage in that kind of communication, I think they're, they're an easy next step um, into it. And then you pay a tax of 35% of well, any of your political expenditures. But so no, no. It's not deductible. No, 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 no. It's not deductible, but if I have no income, there's no tax. Well, that's true. So if I get all the money into the corporation in a way that has no income, there's a, there's a prohibition yes. in the code that doesn't allow you to deduct political contributions. So you've got to get it in tax-free. You, you have to have net income. That's but right. I think I can get it in tax-free. So I, I well, think somebody a, will hire you. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a move there. And I'm, I've been working on trying to figure it out, so I'm not sure about trusts and how you might use trusts in this arena. And then, of course, we've been, we've been fl flirting as tax professors and election law people about when are veterans organizations going to be used as the new vehicle because contributions to veterans organizations are actually deductible uh, and in many ways and they can give to, uh, and they're allowed to engage in election communication. So uh, I don't know if there if there's some fun there with veterans. Those are kind of the things that I would think about. Did your question get into No, I, I think the, the first part was on C4s, right? Mm -hmm. And lobbying. You guys we, we don't have a breakdown. Actually, that's one of our projects this year is to start linking our nonprofit data up more to our lobbying database. But as, as of right now, uh, we don't have breakouts of nonprofits spending, or by type, spending on lobbying. Uh, but we hope we will next time this year. And the regs really don't touch on it at all, because uh, in general, lobbying is considered a social welfare purpose. So ex uh, if you were doing grassroots lobbying, mentioning a candidate's name within 60 days of an election, that would be considered uh, candidate-related activity under the regs. But for the most part, uh, it, it does try a little bit to deal with what we think of as grassroots lobbying, um, but, um, or, you know, communicate, the, the kind of communication which is call Senator X and tell him you dislike Y, um, it, it captures that, but it doesn't capture classic lobbying. Let me ask a dual question um, for the lawyers on the panel. Uh, as a matter of regulation, are there lessons to be learned uh, of disclosure versus 
more command and control regulation approaches, disclosure meaning sunlight is the best disinfectant, as Brandeis said, and uh, the electric light is the best policeman, um, versus setting limits and so forth. And let me ask the uh, journalists on the panel, uh, it, it strikes me as very interesting that the public seems to be aware of the Citizens United case, even though it's a fairly complex case uh, and uh, the degree of awareness of complex issues can be uh, lost, as Peter was pointing out earlier, in terms of how you communicate on radio and television and through other media. And to ask the journalists whether the notion that this is a sort of a continuing scandal has resulted in ever higher thresholds of for outrage, and so the public gets benumbed by it, and therefore uh, the more um, reporting of this has the perverse result of, of leading to uh, less likelihood of, of any plausible reforms. John, you want to start out on the legal side? Well, I, I think that the command and control efforts, uh, you know, like contribution limits or prohibitions or restrictions uh, necessarily alter uh, what happens in this universe of, of campaigning, as I attempted to summarize in my presentation. It's, it's really not a whole lot different than what happens when you tinker with the tax code. You, know, you, you restrict here, you allow deductions there, you incentivize over here. Uh, the whole system changes a little bit to accommodate to to these restrictions, but when it comes to campaign finance, uh, I, I think it's fairly indisputable that you know the more you restrict, the more you alter uh, accountability, disclosure, and, and who participates and in what way. Uh, I, I, I'm convinced that uh, the vast majority of money that pops up through these tax exempt organizations and super PACs. Uh, is fundamentally a result of not allowing those contributors to donate directly either to the candidates or the political parties. Uh, and if you look in jurisdictions that have state elections where they don't have all these bells and whistles, uh, it, you really don't see evidence of all of these devices. Uh, they may pop up, but they, t they tend to be isolated. You know, so in Virginia, uh, which as I mentioned, as disclosure, uh, you know, if, if a entity gives money to a candidate, you know, whether it's Terry McAuliffe or Ken Puccinelli, uh, which is <coughs> the preferred donation source, by the way, as opposed to the party, uh, they report it. It can become a campaign issue. I remember when uh, Pat Robertson gave $50,000 to Jim Gilmore when he was running for governor, and his Democratic opponent made an ad about it. So it was obviously very disclosed and became an issue in the campaign. Unfortunately for the Democratic opponent, it boomeranged on because it drove up uh, turnout down in Chesapeake where uh, Pat Robertson was very popular. Uh, so, it, but you don't have really independent expenditures. There was some in this last election, but nothing comparable to what we're seeing in the federal system. Uh, you, you don't really have that type of process uh, and I think it's directly related to where can people give their money and directly support. Well, you know, part of it is living in the real world um, and <coughs> understanding the system we work in. Um, and we, we have a, a neat program in, in England and, and I think some ability to look at comparative election systems. And England has this just incredibly restrictive campaign finance system. And, and it works in England because they don't have a First Amendment, and they um, have really aggressive enforcement. And so, it's a parliamentary system. And, well, but they still campaign, right? The parliamentary system doesn't stop campaign donations, but it, what it does do is make you able to pass laws uh, pretty, pretty much easier than we can today. Um, and so, there is an ability to have really tight campaign finance regulation and have it work. Uh, I just don't think there's an ability in the United States. So um, I think that's why we've ended up with the patchwork that we have. 
I do think if you could get the votes, you could you could design a constitutional system for broad-based disclosure. But um, I think that's about about where we are today. And and uh, you know, it's more political science and more maybe psychology to figure out uh, whether we're better with high candidate contribution limits. And but but I think what is clear is that we've steered money away from t traditional vehicles, and that makes it much more difficult for us to have accountability. And, and from my own personal expect, per perspective, I'd rather uh, a candidate be the one who's running the ads than, than uh, these third parties. I think the candidates are more responsible. And at least my you know, long time ago experience working in some political campaigns, uh, the candidates were a little nervous about how aggressive to be. And they didn't want to be overly nasty. And they cared about their reputation. And, and so there are some advantages, I think, to having candidate-based uh, advocacy. Thank you. And the journalist, um what are the challenges of telling this story and the effect it has on the public's appetite for reform or I change? think that uh, the public is more attuned to this stuff now than it was a few years ago. Um, I, I, think, I think we've been through a period where it had kind of a numbing effect, but my sense is right now people are so disgusted with Washington that uh, the this kind of coverage feeds into the larger picture where we just feel like nothing works in D.C. And, and maybe this is one of the reasons why. So um, I'm, uh, I, I feel like there is more uh, a more positive response to the stories that I do. The, the stuff that I, the feedback I get like on our website and stuff. Um, I'm, I'm getting more feedback than I was, say, five years ago. I, I guess in my years, my way too many years of covering campaign finance, I feel like there is a limited appetite for the topic. People think it's important. People can get outraged about individual stories. But I think the difficulty for a journalist is making the link between the money coming into the system and policy outcomes or, you know, what's what's going on in other areas. Um, because campaign finance, even though in surveys people always say they care about it and they're outraged by what's going on, when it comes right down to it, it's not one of the issues they're going to vote on. A candidate's stance on campaign finance is not one of the issues they're going to vote on. So I think that, you know, one of the things radio and, and TV can do very well and that we did very well, Peter did very well with our, our Wellspring effort recently was, you know, looking at the money coming in and how it flowed and, or to use a analogy there, I guess, since we're talking about a river in Michigan, um, you know, the outcome on the protection of that river um, and how the change in the Supreme Court, which was affected by the ads that were funded by the group, um, you know, had an impact there. And Peter, as he said, got to go fly fishing too. Um, so I, I think that's the challenge for us. Well, on the, um, the business about uh, that it's not a voting issue, you know, uh, candidates, the, the issue has gone beyond that, I think, that, um, you know, Congress isn't doing anything on this issue. You know, nobody's pointing to um, some bill that if we just had a few more votes, we'd get it through. And I think people just see it as a symptom of, uh, of what's wrong here. And so it, it cuts that way. A, a, much, a much more general yeah. uh, problem that people see than a specific one of one candidate or another candidate. Um, I, I get the impression, when I started at, at CRP, I didn't even know what a 501c4 was. Um, and so I, I never know if my understanding now is how it links to the, the broader culture. But my impression at the time as well was that a lot of even journalists, seasoned campaign finance journalists, were confused about uh, you know whether this group here I'm looking at is the C4 that's spending. All, you know there was a, there was a lot of confusion about you know how much money is going in. What is what is the actual story? What does the picture look like? Um, and I feel like uh, 
we, for the last uh, almost two years now, have been sort of, I say we as CRP and we as people who follow this, um, have been sort of sorting it out and figuring out what the landscape looks like and now might be, and I, so I think that has, to some extent, uh, created a numbing effect because it's just story after story after story of, okay, here's this new trick we found where they're funneling the m hundreds of millions of dollars through these groups and you know it's something you could never imagine to do. Um, but I think now we're at the point where we, we say, all right, we've got pretty much the structure in place. It'll probably change from election, it always changes from election to election, but at least we can sit back and we as a, an organization now can try to say, all right, here are a few things that if you are concerned about it, you can, you can do about it. Because we have been so consumed for a while just trying to figure out what, what, the, what the picture looks like. Now we can say, all right, well, if you want to take some sort of action, here are some things you, you might be able to do. So hopefully, as time progresses, that's what we'll be doing. We'll mix the reporting and the data with, with some more um, actionable uh, uh, information for people. And if I could throw in just one other point here quickly that I think Citizens United had a lot to do with this. People didn't, you know, didn't get into the details of it. What they remember is Citizens United said corporations are people and they can put money in the campaigns. And people say, oh, yeah, I'm a person. I don't have a lot of money to put in the campaigns. What's going on here? And I think that changed the tenor of the debate. Well, we want to thank our panel and thank you for being here. This is, uh, I think, a fascinating discussion of the latest chapter in the long continuing saga of money and politics uh, in America and what it buys and what it does and uh, what's the appropriate way to look at it as well as regulate it. Uh, and we've been greatly enlightened by our panel, I think as a testimonial also to the diligence of the researchers who have uh, tried to untangle the plumbing uh, in these intricate charts of donations to other entities, in turn giving money to still other entities and so forth. Uh, and we hope you will continue to follow the money and follow the subject uh, at opensecrets.org and at the Center for Responsive Politics. And we want to thank our panel. Please join me in the